Hoguera mine will be negotiated on PNG terms. Warring tribes make peace after more than two decades. And Prime Minister pressed to deal with lawlessness. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Thursday's news. Enga Governor Sir Peter Ipatas has weighed in on the Pogera mine debate in reference to the state's revised 33% stake in Oktedi mine. The Enga Governor said the government will determine the terms for Pogera mine as well. He says this time around the PNG government will dictate how much equity share will be given when negotiating with investors. <laughs> Mineral resource Enga that is owned by Enga Provincial Government and landowners of the Pogara mine have a 5% equity stake. While the landowners represented in the Pogara Landowners Association have indicated that they would want to continue with Barrack because of a 10% free equity that had been added onto the existing 5% as a benchmark for negotiations. Enga Governor Sir Peter Ipata stating Octody has set the precedent and that the state and loan owners can have a bigger stake in the mine. Now, with Pogra, we already have 5%. So, we will not settle for anything less than 33 plus 5. So, when we come to the stage of where when we have to negotiate, those are the things that we will negotiate. But Octedi's model is quite different to Pogara due to environmental issues surrounding Octedi with the former owner BHP. The mine was given back to the state to avoid a damaging lawsuit. But Sir Peter adamant that at the end of the day the land belongs to the people and for the government to negotiate the best option for its people. Now because the SML has expired, we are in a position as a state, as a country to actually to offer Barrick and I don't think it is right for the company to think that they can offer us. It's the other way around. In an interview with Barrick CEO Mark Bristow, he said there was room for negotiations and they believe the custodians of the land should have the first say. To the PLOA and other stakeholders, all the different representatives, as you know, there's different categories of landowners and various affected parties. And we engaged and we put together a letter and we increased the economic benefits to 57% in favor of the state and other PNG stakeholders and a reduction of 43%. Uh, for the shareholders. And now with the mining amendments and a proposed organic law changes, giving power to Kumul Mineral Holding Limited as license holder for an expired mining lease would allow the state to dictate the equity share an investor can have in a mine. And I've been uh, front with them all the time. If they had uh, uh, negotiated in good faith with uh, myself in the initial stages before the SML expired, we wouldn't be sitting here arguing. If they had, if they had agreed to carrying our equity, free carried as we wanted, then they would still be their money. Enga governor stating that the structure was the best for the people going forward. He said it would provide capital investment for a mine to operate and this would not be an issue for mineral resource Enga or the government. They've never given us any free carry before. We've been in the business. We've had 5%. We pay up uh, all our capital costs through the mine. That's a, that's, a, that's a good mine. So I'm sure that we will have the cash flow to pay. If it wasn't going to be profitable and, uh, and viable, uh, why would uh, they be interested? Pogara Mine opening up the debate on government law changes and what our mining industry may look like, either becoming a winning situation for the PNG government or the likelihood of investors second guessing whether to invest in PNG. Adelaide Xerox Kari National, MTV News. Two warring tribes in the Molbaya electorate of Western Highlands province gave up fighting after 25 years of being tribal enemies. 
More than 50 lives were lost, properties worth millions of kina were damaged, and people have been displaced for too long. They held a peace ceremony recently and promised to leave fighting and allow services to reach them. The fight was between the Ramui people, who compensated three other warring tribes, a total of 47,000 kina, 102 pigs, including cows, goats, and cascas. It is a way of peace, mainly practiced in the highlands for normalcy to return. Provincial Police Commander Jacob Kamiak, who witnessed the ceremony, told the locals to take ownership of their actions. People must take him ownership, long as the law and order. Long house do have Lomibla, it can look community of Lomibla, now look district of Lomibla, now look province of Lomibla. The fight first started in 1995 over land issues, which saw five people from both parties killed. It continued for three years and ended in 1998, but started again in 2004. This time, more than 50 people were killed and properties worth millions of kina lost. A peace agreement was signed in 2010, allowing all parties to lay down their arms. A lot of children were fatherless and homeless, and many did not complete formal education. The end of Islam, peace and one of some things that come up. You will focus on school. You will focus on business. You will focus on one good plus something, one good plus something, one good plus something, and back to my attention, blow me, me. Go out to the community, and by you, me lose thinking, blow one of something, no good, you must make him blow community. The Ramui people saw the need to compensate the other warring tribes so that peace can prevail and services and development to enter their villages. Me like him development, me like him service, me like him all church, me like him peace. Me like him on the beginning in Blooming go out the country, long bring him good plus service he come. Me like him, sit down from me, come up with some one kind of some, or plus the white man. PPC Jacob Kamiak warned the locals that he won't be risking the lives of his policemen to attend land disputes or tribal fighting. Kamiak urged the people of Western Highlands province to lay down arms and focus in education and religion. Vasanata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. A grade 12 student of Tari Secondary School is one of the latest victims of the continuous tribal fighting in the Hela province. The killing of the male student is related to a tribal fight in Pureni, South Koraba. This killing comes after the Hegani clans of Tebi LLG in Tari Pori Electorate marched in protest demanding their district administration and Prime Minister James Marape intervene and stop the gruesome tribal fights in the province. The student killed was said to be at a roadside in Tari district when his attackers pounced on him. Students of Tari Secondary School marched to the Tari Hospital morgue in mourning after learning of their fellow students' killing. The Education Division of Hela Province held a funeral service for the student outside the Hela Provincial Administration Office in Tari this week before the body of the deceased was handed over to his relatives. In a separate killing incident three weeks ago, a young man was murdered around the same area where the student was killed at Payake village related to the Toria and Arape clans fight. In presenting the petition two weeks ago, protesters in Tebi LLG including men, women and children marched and shouted vigorously saying they have had enough of tribal fighting in the area as it was affecting them severely causing regular fear and panic. The situation is also crippling people's access to basic services like education and health as well as community development programs. All these are school are affected by trouble fight between Erebe, Ma, Toiria. To play you no know, fight inside long battlefield long to play yet, to play run run all over the hub where all over the community sit down good long any all wall on disturbing Ma at the same time all disturbing all schools. Bla hagen blob stablo erem blob bla bla then the council councillors, Sani Pinis, Lombla like like in Chevis, must come and tell her in Among these group of women farmers, 
The lady in yellow shirt is a second term village councillor and farmer of Kuandi Ward 2 in Tebi LG. She has been mobilizing women to grow crops but says it is difficult to do so as this is hampered by tribal fighting. Prime Minister James Marape is yet to respond to the petition presented by Tebi LLG protesters, although attempts have been made to get a response from his office. Dennis Orere, National MTV News. The growing law and order issues in the Hela and Southern Highlands provinces was brought up in Parliament today when former Prime Minister and a member for Yalibu Pangia, Peter O'Neill, put questions to Prime Minister James Marape on what the government was doing to address this. O'Neill based his questions on Prime Minister Marape's promise made a few weeks after he took office as Prime Minister and when visiting a mass killing in his electorate said, and I quote, I will come for you. I will come for you was a phrase used by James Marape back then when condemning a massive killing of women and children in a village in his electorate. His words were used against him today when Peter O'Neill highlighted the ongoing law and order issues both in Hela and Southern Highlands. It is becoming a daily event that someone or some number of people, Papua New Guinea, young innocent people are dying every day. I want you to remind you the Prime Minister, that on the first few days of your government, several people in our province died. You undertook, these are your words, I am coming for you. Let me remind you those words. After almost 16 months in government, there is not one single arrest. Arrest all, all these brutal murders that are taking place in our country, right across our country. Only was also concerned that millions of kina have been spent on COVID-19 compared to the attention and resources put into addressing the rising law and order issues, not just in these two provinces, but across the country. Marape, as cool and calm as he is, said law and order issues is not something that was created overnight. It goes back in time and is an indication of neglect by successive governments. The current uh, instances of lack of policing throughout our country is part of the problem that we've inherited thus far. One question O'Neill also demanded an answer to was the engagement of the police commissioner to deal with COVID-19 when there were pressing law and order issues around the country. Marape, however, defended his minister and the commissioner's role in the COVID-19 fight. On the issue on, on, the issue on uh, uh, police commissioner doing his job, the police minister is balancing his time very well. Uh, the pandemic bill gives power to the police uh, commissioner to be sitting at, as the controller. But that doesn't mean for one bit he's neglected his day job. He further said with the approval of the Ella provincial police structure, 300 police personnel will be stationed in Hela with a new barracks to be built in Heights and a new military base to be established in Hela. This is to save the cost of flying soldiers in and out of the province every time there is a need. Ruth Rungula, National MTV News. And National MTV News continues with more from Question Time in Parliament after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. Almost two years after APEC 2018 and questions continue to be raised on when the APEC report will be tabled and the outstanding payments for service providers. When responding, Prime Minister James Marape revealed the Works Department alone owes contractors a massive 5 billion kina. This 5 billion kina is owed to contractors and when the Marape Stephen government reorganized the supplementary budget last year, set aside 300 million kina to pay off some of these debts. Minister Nali will confirm that uh, we have over 5 billion kina worth of denials. These are government contracts issued by previous government of which I was a part of. But we had no guts or no commitment to settle these contracts that we issued ourselves. 
Marape revealed this while attending to questions raised by the governor for Central, Robert Agarobe, who was concerned that many SMEs and local businesses would be forced to close if the government does not pay some of their outstanding payments for services rendered during APEC 2018. A lot of these businesses also took part in this APEC program and have a year to be paid. Also, with the APEC meeting that was conducted in this country, a huge amount of money was laid down and invested in this, in this meeting. And the people of Papua New Guinea and a lot of these businesses also want to know what sort of benefits are we now trying to be, are we ripping off? Marape said money has also been budgeted in the 2020 budget to retire debts and the departments of finance and treasury will establish genuine contractors and pay. He said the delay in releasing the final APEC report was between the Auditor General Finance and the Prime Minister's department, but the SE should clear instructions for this report to be ready before the 2021 budget is tabled in November. Prime Minister Marape said hosting APEC was a milestone achievement for the country and gave credit where it was due. Uh, whilst we may not all agree on uh, hosting it at a time when our economy was hard, but APEC and hosting is a milestone achievement uh, by the previous government and it's something that we must all commend. I think the work now remains is for all of us to work to link the connectivity that was made in the APEC occasion. He said it was now up to the government and future governments to make connections with the APEC economies by utilizing the relationships established during APEC 2018. Meantime, he said the delay in the release of the promised 200 million Kina stimulus package for SMEs was because banks were drafting and setting the terms of lending and this is almost done. He said they have chosen banks to handle this package for transparency purposes. Ruth Rongola, National MTV News. The country has adequate laws to deal with violence, including gender-based violence, but effective policing of these laws is the problem. This was Prime Minister James Marape's response to questions put to him about the rising gender-based violence being experienced across the country. NCD Governor Poes Pakop, while acknowledging that the country was facing the COVID-19 pandemic, said gender-based violence is also a pandemic that needs urgent attention to protect women and girls in PNG. First, what steps, special or otherwise, the government will take or plans to take to respond to this crisis? Second, can the government consider set up, setting up a parliamentary committee on GBV so that it can continue to monitor, brief parliament and government to the extent of this crisis and recommended steps we should take or need to take to reduce or ideally eliminate gender-based violence in our country. Prime Minister James Marape acknowledged that violence, including gender-based violence, was a crime and there were existing laws to deal with it. First and foremost, our country has uh, enough law, educate law as I speak, to deal with matters of gender-based violence or violence for that matter. But effective policing of these laws has been uh, one of the causes of offenders getting away free all the time when uh, crime is being committed amongst us. First and foremost, any form of gender-based violence is a criminal offense. He said his government has given some thought to this and will set a pathway for GBV to protect vulnerable girls and women. He added that police have been instructed to open specific complaint and registry desks in all police stations around the country to set a pathway for accepting GBV complaints. So that is something that is being now installed whilst if it has not been, uh, if it has not been uh, effectively uh, set up as yet then uh, instruction has gone out for every police station nationwide and every police station commanders and every uh, provincial polices nationwide to ensure that that pathway of accepting complaints 
And as far as gender-based violence is concerned, it's set up in all our police stations. The government is in discussion with the National Research Institute to establish the terms of reference and they will make recommendations based on research findings. This will help the government set up a bipartisan parliamentary committee and Marape says he wants to see this happen in this session of parliament. Ruth Rungola, National MTV News. The Family and Sexual Violence Unit in East New Britain province have thrown their support behind the campaign against gender-based violence. A two-day event that will begin tomorrow with the theme Pamili Knock and Pite, look out in Pamili, hopes to educate the public about how issues relating to gender-based violence can be addressed. The event will be hosted by the Sexual Violence Unit with support from Coca-Cola and the Pacific Kanaka Music and Events Limited at the Ralum Showground. The awareness campaign comes amidst the unprecedented reports of domestic abuse in the country. East New Britain province sees about two to three cases of abuse every week, most of them involving sexual abuse of minors and female victims. Only a few of these abuses are reported to police, while many continue to remain unreported and resolved out of court. The main highlights of the two-day event will be music performances by local artists, where the organisers believe will amplify the main message behind gender-based violence. A total of 25 troop carrier vehicles were presented to PNGDF today to help address mobility issues. This was made possible through the Defence Cooperation Program between PNG and Australia. The vehicles will be utilised by the PNGDF in support of government's response to COVID-19 in NCD and operational areas, particularly along the borders. The troop carriers will now ease the burden of mobility that the PNG Defence Force has been facing over the years. It will be used to support the COVID-19 response in the nation's capital, including all PNG DF operations around the country. During the presentation today, a small demonstration was made on how the vehicles will be used. This will significantly enhance our mobility capacity to support our troops in the front line to conduct border patrols and also deficiency in mobility assets in the training and administration of the PNG Defence Force. Australian Defence Force has been supporting the PNG DF in many operations through the Defence Cooperation Programme. They supported PNG DF during the APEC Leaders Summit in 2018. They also presented the PNG Navy with a patrol boat and are involved in the development of the PNG DF Air Transport Wing. The presentation of the troop carrier vehicles is part of this partnership. I'm particularly proud to hand these vehicles over uh, to Commander PNG DF today, General Toropo. Sir, thank you so much for your ongoing support and your investment in this defence partnership between our two great nations. The Toyota Land Cruiser troop carriers are off-road capable vehicles with the capacity to carry 12 soldiers. And with the limited resources, soldiers were also urged to use the vehicles responsibly and to use them for military purposes only. The PNZDF commander says directives will be given to those managing the properties to ensure the vehicles are managed well. Don't abuse it. If you look after it, it will look after you for your operations and your military activities. And we can all be happy because when we use these assets to deliver our core tasks, our people, our government will be proud and happy. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. Lay's Market is currently undergoing a major cleanup to address health issues at the market and to implement COVID-19 social distancing for vendors. The market was temporarily closed on Monday and would be open for the public to use by next week Monday. Lay MP John Rosso said there are plans to build a new market that would be funded by the New Zealand government at a cost of 30 million kina. There's plans to build a brand new market. Uh, there's 30 million uh, put aside by the New Zealand government to uh, do that. There's, uh, we are in the process at the moment of uh, building a new market. 
and also we're trying to look at the safety at the market. There's been a lot of complaints of uh, pickpocketing a kind of So I've spoken to the Metropolitan Commander and the CEO for the city. They're trying to make uh, measures to fix the address those issues of pickpocketing and stuff. It's as I said, it's things that we have to live with and try to combat. And every time there's a new issue. So the Metropolitan Commander has assured me that they'll send uh, more police down there to uh, ensure people's safety and also how to manage the market. The CEO has taken steps on board, rearranged a few of the issues at the market, internal issues to address address these issues. You got Tok Tok Tool or Line Osem or Black Market Mamas uh, go buy him something and sit now inside again. The CEO is aware of this. I've had talks with him to see if we can address the issues down there. We are aware of it and we're trying our best to uh, fix it. And now looking at the NAS fund market report, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.288 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina is buying 0.2795 US dollars, 0.3820 Australian dollars, 0.2880 Euro and 28.94 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading lower. Coffee and cocoa closed lower, copper closed higher. Crude oil is trading higher, palm oil closed lower and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 83.48 points higher. The ASX 200 is trading at 9.8 points higher and the All Ordinaries is trading at 16.1 points higher. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back after these short messages. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Two men charged under the Fisheries Act for harvesting sea cucumbers while a ban was in place pleaded guilty before the Lorengau District Court on Tuesday. Manus Police Commander Chief Inspector David Yapu said one of the men is an escapee from Lorengau Correctional Center and remains in custody, while the other paid a court fine of 1,000 kina and was released. Meanwhile, four students from Manus and Elkom Secondary School in Lorengau were charged for being in possession of marijuana and are locked up in police cells. The main suspect, an adult man, fled when police raided his village in Tedidu LLG and uprooted marijuana plants in his village in Tingo. Brewing giant SP Brewery has come on board to assist COVID-19 frontliners. Funds of 10,000 kina were presented to St. John Ambulance on Tuesday with the notion to support the work of the non-profitable organization during the COVID-19 pandemic. Corporate Affairs Manager John Nelkara says health is everyone's business and it is important to fight the good fight in mitigating the risk and spread of COVID-19. CEO of St. John Ambulance Matt Cannon shared similar views. Um, I know that they've, felt they've forged many partnerships, especially with the National Department of Health, uh, NCDC, you know, um, uh, and you know all the other all the other government agencies out there. Um, this little gesture of um, um, sponsorship by way of 10,000 kina, um, I hope you know they can put it to uh, put it to, towards their cause. It is a huge um, t um, task. It's a momentous. Um, uh, challenge to overcome uh, this COVID pandemic and, and all the uh, associated challenges to it. So this little funding that can help support them to, with their logistics or uh, how they are run their operation. Uh, thanks for the support from SP Brewery to St John Ambulance here today. Uh, as we as we embark and we continue on this this uh, journey to support uh, government of Papua New Guinea during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's important to remember that um, Whilst this pandemic is taking place, people still need the normal health care uh, that, that they rely upon St John for uh, all around the NCD, Central Province and uh, East New Britain. And hopefully, uh, soon in, in Ley, uh, we will have services. This support will, will help us to continue the services and it's through partnerships like this as a not-for-profit organisation that's been a part of Papua New Guinea for over 63 years. We rely on the support of the community to ensure that we can continue to serve the community. 
The PNG Council of Churches has commenced a sensitization workshop for church leaders in NCD today. This is part of the church's approach to reduce the risk of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. The two-day workshop, in partnership with the government, is being held at the Port Moresby Archdiocese of the Catholic Church. On the very next day, after being part of a massive National Day of Prayer and Repentance program, the PNG Council of Churches began the two-day workshop in NCD this morning, with similar sensitization workshops expected to be hosted in other regions of the country in the coming weeks. We know churches, we have uh, almost more than, more than 6 million population in the country, and that's the bulk of it bulk of the population are with the churches and churches have a great role to play in trying to contain the virus and we are trying to, we are calling for uh, sensitization workshops with with church leaders around the country for me this current workshop that we are attending is very critical how best do we involve the church the church in PNG have a critical role to play uh, normally when you go to every village in PNG uh, if there are no government services or people in there, the churches are always there because the churches are with the people. So we need to make sure that we, we work with the churches to provide them the guidelines, uh, but also to encourage the churches to make sure that we roll out the new norms. Huh? Workshop participants were presented with updated and detailed information on COVID-19 by representatives from the National Control Center, World Health Organization and other relevant bodies. Sessions were also organized to allow participants to ask questions to a panel of experts on the subject and also discussions to formulate the way forward for various church denominations in the new Pla Pasin or Maori Matamata approach. At a time when a proposal is being put forward for parliament debate on the legalizing of PNG as a Christian country, General Secretary Joseph made these comments. When we talk about uh, declaring Papua New Guinea as a Christian nation, uh, it, it's not uh, really undermining the religious backgrounds we have, and not, all, not also uh, uh, saying no to the other religions. I think uh, we are an open country. We will allow these others to come in, but then at the back of our minds, we must remember that the Christian principles are the principles that uh, hold together our nation and our people. Dennis Orere, National MTV News. And to Chukai Sports with Kilawani, some good news in weightlifting. Yes, Helen, Dikato are ready to take on the Global Online Challenge. I'll tell you about it in Chukai Sports when we come back. Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. Papua New Guinea's weightlifting queen, Dika Toa, has been invited to participate in an international event. It's the landmark global online weightlifting competition. Over 100 weightlifters from 32 countries will participate in the inaugural online International Weightlifting Cup starting 28th of August 2020. Slated to take part in the event are Olympic and world champions like Kazakhstan's Zalifia Chinshanlo, Louis Mosquera of Colombia, China's Li Wenwen and Papua New Guinea's Dika Toa. I've been invited by the Uzbekistan um, Weightlifting Federation uh, for their independence celebration. Um, so on Friday, um, which is tomorrow and Saturday, um, Friday I will be competing and uh, Moria will be competing on Saturday. It is an online competition, so um, everybody will be um, competing uh, using the Zoom application. Um, and the competition will be run um, as normal, like the usual competitions. Meantime, while preparations towards qualifying for the Tokyo 2021 is ongoing, 
Papua New Guinea's weightlifting queen is confident next year's Olympics is within reach. We're just waiting on what the IOC and the International Weightlifting Federation has to say with regards to competitions, but um, what I have heard is that whoever ranks first in the continental um, championships or in their region, they automatically go into um, the Olympic Games. And currently, Toa is ranked first in the 49th category in the Oceania region. If she qualifies for Tokyo 2021, she will be the first ever woman in the world in the code of weightlifting to have attended the Olympics five times. It has been an amazing journey to be the first um, and making history once again. Because um, in uh, looking back at the 2000 Olympics, I was the first ever woman um, to you know, lift off um, an Olympic platform. Um, 20 years of lifting, uh, um, it's just been amazing. PNG RFL is mourning the death of former PNG Kumul Center Garia Kora. Kora, aged 66 of Hanuabada in Parabada in Central Province, died at his Hodai home in Hanuabada village early yesterday morning after succumbing to a short illness. PNG RFL Chairman Sandy Saka said late Kora played his only test in the historic 37-6 win over France on May 29, 1977 in Port Mosby. MTV and the Rugby League family throughout the country extend our sincere condolences to his family and children. A funeral service will be held this Saturday, August 29, 2020 at 4 p.m. at the Lakani Toy Memorial Church in Hanuabada. And Trukai Sports continues with more stories making headlines overseas when we come back. Stay with us. Trukai Sports Welcome back to Trukai Sports. It's been an unprecedented day in sports history. NBA basketball stars in America have boycotted their playoffs, with some teams now considering pulling out of the rest of the season. Other sports are following suit. Confusion reigned as Orlando players and officials waited for a Milwaukee Bucks team that would never show. What nobody knew is behind closed doors, Milwaukee had decided to boycott. We are calling for justice for Jacob Blake. A stand against the police shooting of African-American Jacob Blake shot seven times with his kids watching in the car. The Bucks home court is just 45 minutes from the scene. Bucks guard Sterling Brown, a victim of police brutality himself. Despite the overwhelming plea for change, there has been no action. So our focus today cannot be on basketball. It set off a chain reaction as leaders from opposing NBA teams agreed to boycott all of today's playoff games, which have now been postponed a first in NBA history. The Women's League followed suit players wearing shirts with marks of seven bullet holes. Milwaukee also led baseball's boycott. Major League Soccer boycotted soon after, along with tennis star Naomi Osaka. We've been hung, we've been shot, and it's amazing. Why we keep loving this country, and this country does not love us back. I think it's for best for me to support the players and just not be here tonight. Leading commentators joining players to push for change. African Americans are fed up. People that care are fed up. Four years ago today, NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick took the first major stand against racial inequality, and it cost him his career. With no real change since then, the NBA and others have been forced to take things a step further, with discussions on whether or not to cancel the season continuing tomorrow. And Trukai Sports ends there. Helen will have the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. Bye for now. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region possible showers and rain drizzles then fine morning in port moresby 
possible rain drizzles tonight and tomorrow in Daru, Kerama and Alotau. Chance of evening showers, then fine morning in Popandita. In the Mamasa region, fine weather, then possible early morning rain drizzle tomorrow. Fine weather in Middang, fine weather, then possible rain drizzles in Wewak and Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, possible evening showers and morning rain drizzle in Loringau. Possible evening rain drizzles, then fine morning in Kokopo and Rabao. Rain showers tonight and tomorrow in Kaviang. Mostly fine weather though, cloudy in Kimbe and a possible showers and rain tonight, then cloudy morning in Boka. And in the Highlands region, possible evening showers and morning fog in Mount Hagen. Mostly fine weather, then morning fog in Goroka and Kundiawa. And chance of rain drizzles tonight and tomorrow in Mendi and Wabeg. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that's the way it is this Thursday, 27th of August, 2020. From all of us here at MTV, pleasant feeling. Good night.